Oh, Sherlock, I hear you. Come here, you side eye and your mother has a mama. What? Yeah, why don't you come over here, you pussy king? And your mama has a so mama. What? Do you kiss your mother with that mouth? Welcome to Baseball Biz. I'm Mark Corbett, your host, and once again joining me is our special guest host, Brandon No Way. Brandon, as you may know, can be found also on Twitter at the Sports Blitz One. So you can check him out there, and you can find us, of course, at the Baseball Biz on Twitter. So thank you very much. Hey, and you heard that little message. What what was going on? I mean, obviously somebody was cursing at somebody, and what happens when those things? We're, we want to talk a little about bad behavior and bad consequences. But right now today, we'll we'll, t- we'll start a little lightheartedly, but at the same time, a little serious too. Brandon, I would like to submit the following. I, I would like to submit the, um, I don't know, first award should go to the hitting coach of the Houston Astros. That's none other than Alex Centron for his leadership and language and hitting skills. Oh, that sounds like a nice award. Yeah. And I'm sure that Mr. Lorianos, who is with the Oakland A's, appreciates that as well. If we look at what happened the other day, I don't know that everybody knows this, but the Oakland A's and one of our favorite teams, the Houston Astros, played together and didn't play well together, evidently, because Mr. Lorianos on the Oakland A's had benefited uh, from some love from the Houston Astros or maybe just incompetence. He had been hit once in a previous game and then twice in the next game. So there wasn't a lot of love going on between the Astros and the Oakland A's at that point. Mr. Laurianos, after he was hit the second time in the back, as he was walking at first, I think he gave some instructions to the pitcher about how to do a little better job of pitching not to hit people. He could have been doing a better job. He's been hit three times already. Yeah, come on. I mean <laughs> – Jesus, Pete, somebody needs to talk to that pitching coach because that's just crazy nuts. But as, he, as he's walking there and giving instruction to, <laughs> to the pitcher, and like I said, they should have been better. But he, matter of fact, Loriano said in a later interview that he recognized that there, there's a lot of newbies and that some of those things are going to happen. He, didn't, he said he didn't necessarily believe it was intentional. But uh, even so, his comments to the pitcher were not taken well by the Houston Astros dugout. No, and there were some words were exchanged. Unfortunately, we didn't get to hear them, but apparently it was somebody's mother. Yeah, Alex Centron evidently said a few words about Laurianus's mother, and that's never a nice way to encourage anyone. But, but he was encouraging in a sense. I mean, here we are. We're talking about Alex Centron, Houston Astros. He's the hitting coach, and he's speaking to somebody's mother, and he's waving, I believe, Lorianos to come, come on, come on here in the dugout. And Centron even takes one step on the top as if he's stepping out of the dugout. At that point, everything happens. That's when Lorianos starts to take a, take a in, head in the direction of the dugout, and the dugout takes the direction toward him. And as you're pointing out, uh, Centron showed how much he was committed as a leader to this team because what happened then? Oh, he, he's yelling at him, and he's you know, motioning, you know, come here talk about your mother and he gets what he wants and Loriano starts running towards him and you get what you want. And then three guys on Astros jump in front of him and tackle Loriano and Centron just uh, sitting there staring over him. It's crazy. Absolutely insane. And and as you and I were talking before the show that actually Loriano's had some history with the Astros before all this, didn't he? Yeah. From the sounds of things, he was there in the minor leagues and, Centron was actually Loriano's coach. So a little bit of a history there. Yeah, I gotta even wonder, juicier. Yeah, I got to wonder what else may have been going on. But I was glad to hear Loriano was saying that the catcher for the Astros was someone I think he'd played with in that, in that uh, minor leagues before. And he came and actually tackled Loriano to cover him, to keep him from going crazy insane, plus also to keep him probably from getting beat up by the Astros and whoever else was out there. So kudos to him. The I'm joking about giving the sports award there to Mr. Centron, who's a coach and a leader, somebody who should know better, somebody who needs to be able to set an example for all these young men during a difficult time. And that's not what happened. 
we were talking before and we both like agree completely. Like your coach is supposed to be the grown up in the room, the leader, even though they're all grown adults, the coach is supposed to be like above and beyond the example. And he, he didn't do a good job of that. Absolutely not. And, and Dusty Baker, these guys are making the job more and more difficult for him coming into all this as the manager. But to have coaches like Mr. Centron doing that, it was, it was just reprehensible. And I expected, you know, something to come down on this. But whatever penalty they may incur, I was saying, well, Centron ought to get double. But I think something just broke here recently. What, do you got something on the ticker there? What's happening? Yeah, just a little bit before we started recording, the suspensions came down for both Cintron and Loriano. Loriano, he got five games for charging the dugout, and Cintron got 20 games for instigating the fight, which is believed to be the largest levy against an MLB coach. Oh, my gosh, 20 games. I mean, that's, that's a third of the season this time around. My gosh. Well, that's... Somebody for the Astros finally got suspended. Wow. Did, I guess this kid, did this come down, from, I guess, from MLB, probably from our good boy, Mr. Manfred? I I saw it from Bob Nightingale. Okay, well, never mind. I'll stop there. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's geez and crackers, man. That's some serious, serious impact. But they they need to. This needs to be. There's a lot they need to take serious right now. And we've been talking about COVID nineteen, and we've been talking about you know the mask and everybody everybody being careful. And what happened the other day at that Oakland A's Nationals game was anything but careful. Um, both teams being exposed to one another, several of the players without masks piling on top of one another. Proximity was not something in place at that point. Okay? And what the, the umps are, are shouting at players who are up in the stands too, because some of the players aren't in the dugout if they're not playing actively in the game. And they're telling those guys to stay up there. So it was a free-for-all. And I know it can be quite entertaining in, in years past to see some of that. And like I said, I've never been a fan of it, but I know it can be entertaining. But right now, that stuff does not need to happen, period. Yeah, and I mean, you've, we've known each other for a little while. You know, I'm not big offended by the fights. I enjoy them every now and then. Right. It's just really not the time and place for it right now. There are bigger things going on right now than just yell at each other, flip each other the bird, do that. There you, there you go. Yeah, that's, that's just as good. It gets your point across. Well, it's it's funny you mentioned that because I did see on one of my favorite uh, resources, the TMZ Sports Edition, <laughs> that, <laughs> that when the Rays were playing the other night, Kevin Kiermaier, who always does stupendous out there in the outfield for the Rays, he was chasing down a ball out there in Fenway, and a young man from Boston had just hit this. Man, it was really looking good. It looked like it might even go out. And you see one of the other uh, Boston Red Sox standing up there, and he's just – Shouting, yes, go, go, go. He's taking his hand pointing like he's going to push the ball out himself and just gesturing so they will. And lo and behold, the ball doesn't go all the way out. And Mr. Kiermaier catches that ball. And as he does, they go back to that same young player who's pointing at the ball. And he's no longer pointing at the ball. He's pointing at Mr. Kiermaier and giving him the single finger salute, the middle finger salute, salute I might add. And, and he suddenly has a presence of mind because it's just happened – all of a sudden, he said, whoop, and he takes those hands and he brings them together almost like he's in contemplation or praying. I couldn't tell which, but I, I thought that was hilarious. And I'm so glad to see that, you know, a high quality sports organization like TMZ Sports was able to capture this sort of activity because it needs to be told. It's a special story and everybody needs to hear it. Yeah. All right, people. TMZ. TMZ, they do great stuff. I <laughs> don't really read a lot of it, but it, it's, it's a guilty pleasure every now and then. He's like a little, he's like when a little kid swears in front of his parents and he, like, he covers his mouth. He's like, oh, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> it's like, oops. And that's exactly what it looked like. I thought, you know, mom's watching you right now. She watches all your games. <laughs> You're going to get a phone call later. <laughs> that's right. The, that's, that wasn't too serious. But what was something that happened much more seriously was with the Indians. They had been playing up in Chicago and – Everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. You know, Rob Manfred and MLB and the Players Association got together, put together that 101-page document. You know, it had everything in from it from uh, having a infection control prevention coordinator and later added, I think they've got a, basically a cop, you know, to make sure that everybody's, yeah, compliance officer, there you go, to make sure they're doing everything right. Evidently, some chose not to do that 
And let's see, one of them was uh, Zach Playsock and uh, Mike Clevenger. First, we heard about uh, Zach because he was returning to the hotel room at 3 o'clock in the morning when he was supposed to never be out anyway. So he got tagged, and the Cleveland organization said, guess what, you're not flying back with the rest of the team. So here's some lunch money, and hope you find your way there because you're not playing. I don't know exactly what measures they took beyond that, but that was the initial one. But evidently, Mike Clevenger had gotten out there as well, another young man player with the Indians. And, and lo and behold, he was kind of keeping the cards close to the vest, and his, he was flying with the rest of the team. He said, I don't know if he just suddenly had pangs of guilt, but he, he came forward and said, you know what, I was actually out last night too. And he said, what? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was out last night too. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're on the team with all of your fellow players here. You've been out at bars and all that with the other night. And your potential for infection, not that he has or doesn't have it, but the potential there is huge. Why, why, is it, why aren't you the selfless human being that all the rest of these guys are that are staying in the hotel rooms who are abiding by this compliance? Why aren't you doing that? Also, was it, there was a, another, another play on the team uh, who's... Yeah, Carlos Carrasco. Did he? A little over a year ago now, he came out and said he had like leukemia. I believe it was in his blood. And somehow, for some reason, he's still playing this year. I would have opted out if I were him. He opted in. He's still playing. And it shows that it was a really selfish move by Clevenger and Plesak because, you know, even though they caught Plesak and sent him home, which, you know, that's the right thing to do. The Indians, everything right. I've seen, they've been very strict about it. It's like they're taking this really serious, which I commend them for. If Clevenger did, you know, stand up and say, hey, I was out too, well, I respect you coming out and being honest about it. It's already too late. You flew back with the team. You don't need that long. And it could really affect Carrasco because he is immune, immunodeficient. I believe that's how you say it. This could affect him even more than a normal person. It's been interesting this season. I mean, I think there's a lot of people who are selfless and who are abiding by the rules. And there's people who have just been exposed to it and had absolutely, not that you blame anybody who has this, but for one reason or another. And the impact on this season has been huge. We're looking at a 60 game season right off the bat. There we are with the Marlins from Miami. And yeah, which we know is like <laughs> the hotbed for COVID early on. So these guys, I don't think they had to do anything. All they had to do is be from Miami and uh, had <laughs> Several things going on in, right off the bat. You know, they've been up in Philly, and I think the next night the Yankees were supposed to be playing there and against the Phillies, and they said, you want us in which one of the clubhouse rooms? <laughs> I'm sorry, who was there last night? Ain't going to happen. Well, you know, what, what, do you, what do you do then? So they start rescheduling games. They start trying to find out what's going to happen here, there, and then something else pops up, and suddenly the Phillies have some people that are out, and surprise. And then the Cardinals. Oh, my gosh, man, the Cardinals. Well, tell us a little bit about the Cardinals. Kind of share some of that. We were going back and forth a little before the show a few hours ago, and this tweet popped up, and it said that, you know, the Cardinals are supposed to be playing a doubleheader against the Tigers on Thursday, <laughs> and they ended up having to cancel those two as well. And as of now, the Cardinals have only played five games, and the team in the division, the Reds, has played 19. So that's a 25% difference in games right there. Just completely wiped off. I don't know. I know that Manfred's trying to make this thing work, and there was supposed to be a 16-game playoff, and how do you determine some of these things as far as by wins? No, you can't. There's no way that the Cardinals can make those up. You know, you do double headers every day for three weeks, and you'd still have that, plus the logistics of getting those teams that were supposed to originally play you into that. It's insane. So, I mean, this is going to have to be done by percentages if it's done at all. Yeah, and and what's the – criteria for it. you can't just do it solely on win percentage you have to have like a minimum number of games because yeah i mean look at the Cardinals right now they're, they're in second place in their division they've only played <laughs> five games we early on manfred said like the only way they would shut down the season is if there was no competitive balance and i think we're pretty close to that right now yeah well, i don't know about you but just where, where do they go oh i don't know brother i mean it, it's to me it, i want everybody to be healthy but 
it, to me at this point, it's just watching the game because I don't see any any value in trying to say, oh, we won, and certainly not if it's something like the Cardinals coming up through that. And God love them, and I wish all them and their fans well. But it's it's just nuts to even think that they can be considered for one of the 16 teams in the playoff. So there we are. We're 60 games. We're, what, three weeks into this monster. And as you were talking about the disparity between the Cardinals and some of the other ones in their division, it's getting to be a little – Little nuts, little nuts. You know, one thing I'm concerned about, too, is is there's a lot going on today with the NCAA. And while we're talking about football with the NCAA on Baseball Biz, by the way, you're listening to, and can be found on iTunes and uh, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, et cetera. While we're talking about baseball here, the one thing that I, I do want to recognize is that the conversations that are being had today by several conference presidents, they're going to determine what funding for the rest of the programs. You and I were talking again earlier. Can can you share a little bit about what you see there? It's no secret college football is like massive. It's king in, in a sports world. And the reason why there's such a big deal around this is because football is the big moneymaker you have the big time teams making easily around 100 million just for the one year right with all their contracts even though a lot of that money goes into the football program they also use a lot of that money to help feed the non-revenue programs such as baseball there's a big concern about that and we've already seen it because teams like boise state and bowling green i believe have actually cut their baseball programs because they can't afford it because there may not be football this year it's going to be insane and you know, we've got everybody talking, and as far as the administration, how this is going to work, it's it's going to be interesting because if you've got players who want to play, if you've got some coaches saying, no, the safety of my players is not going to, would be compromised, if you've got schools that say it would, would be compromised, if you have other ones who say, I want to play, and not only does this coach, some of the coaches, I think from Nebraska said, not only does he want to play, if the conference doesn't, He'll find someplace else to take his team and go play. I'll pick up my toys and go home or wherever that may be. Yeah, you had the Big Ten. They've, they've really been kind of like out on the forefront of this. There was a alleged preliminary vote a couple of days ago where they voted 12 to 2 not to play, but they came out and said, no, that's preliminary. It's not official. It's, <laughs> no, don't worry about it yet. There was that. You have the SEC who's – they're basically delaying it. They sound like they want to get – every little bit of information they can and wait till the last minute to make that decision. Yeah. The PAC 12, they got their own thing going on. They're threatening to, you know, unionize players. That's a whole nother, whole nother topic. And the big 12 or big 10, too confusing. The big 10 has their own problems to deal with because there are people on Twitter reporting that programs, big time programs like Ohio state, Michigan, Penn state, and Nebraska, if the Big Ten doesn't play, they could jump over to the Big 12 and play there, which <laughs> that would be pretty exciting for me because, you know, bigger teams going against each other. But that would really shake things up and possibly alter college football forever. Well, we know we're in strange times and strange things are going to happen. It's how things fall out. I mean, the most thing we worry about with everybody is our health. But it's also interesting to see the mechanisms change during this. And, and I know it's not a one-size-fits-all sort of thing, but the one thing that is you were pointing out too, is that because football and basketball are the big money makers for the universities. So if these teams aren't playing, then the trickle down, guess what? They're the ones who are making the money that pays for the smaller sports or the less revenue sports. So if it's volleyball, baseball, et cetera, it's going to impact them. So this does impact baseball. It's going to impact a lot of players, not just in the football, but all the way through. It's going to be interesting to see if the NCAA stands up, puts a hand down on the table and says, this is the way it's going to be. They haven't done that. And I think there should probably be some unanimity on this. I think some teams, if they choose not to play, they should, they shouldn't. I think there needs to be a direction from the NCAA on this. Yeah. And that's really been a problem for the NCAA for pretty much as long as I can remember my whole life is even though it's under, you know, the brand NCAA, all the conferences act on their own. Yeah. And you see it now. It's basically a complete free-for-all. You have some saying, and we don't know what we're going to play. We're thinking of not 
and Northern Illinois in the MAC, they said they're not going to play. But then you have programs in like the SEC, ACC saying, no, we want to play. We're going to play. It's basically a free-for-all. There's no unifying governing body in college sports. Yeah, that's that's all too true. So, well, let's hope they can work it out because I know the future of a lot of young athletes are at stake and certainly their health, you know, could be. So we want to make sure that those people are safe. And I hope all those that are making decisions make sure that they have safe conditions for their players, whether they're playing or not. So it's, it's difficult times, but I think we're going to come through this okay. Here's the thing. I'd like to get back to, to the game of baseball. If we could kind of wrap up the rest of the show here with you at giving us at the Sports Plus One, going ahead and give us the rundown of what's been happening in baseball this week as far as games and such. All right. Well, we'll start with this weekend down here at the Trump. We had the Savage Yankees coming in, take on the Rays, but they dropped that series three games to one. A little bit of a whining coming from the the men in pinstripes, but hey, that's the usual. Then you had up in the D.C. area, the the, the Orioles taking on the Nationals. They only played the first two games with the Orioles taking the first two, but third game was postponed due to weather. That will be made up this Friday the 14th. Then in Pennsylvania, I had the Tigers taking on the Pirates. And that was the Tigers' first game back since the series against the Cardinals was suspended or postponed. And that was their first game in five days as they swept the Pirates. Then you had the Marlins up at City Field taking on the Mets with the Mets taking that series two games to one. And the Blue Jays up in Fenway with the, the Red Sox taking that series two games to one. Then we had another sweep with the Royals sweeping the, the Twins up in KC three to none. Then two AL Central rivals, the Indians and White Sox, taking on each other in Chi-Town. You had the Indians taking that one two to one. And then the Reds going into Milwaukee to take on the Brew Crew with the Reds taking that series two to one. An AL West rival, Angels take going into Darlington to take on the Rangers in that beautiful new stadium of theirs. But the result wasn't so pretty for the Rangers, or the Angels, excuse me, as they swept that series three games to none over the Halos. Wow. A little bit of a fracas here. You had the Astros going into Oakland to take on the A's. And the A's not only beat up the Astros, but they also swept the series three games to none. Then you had the Diamondbacks heading into California to take on the Padres, with the Padres taking that series two games to one. Big NL West rivalry in, the, in Hollywood as you had the Giants taking on the Dodgers, with the Dodgers taking that one two to one. And you had the Rockies heading up to the Northwest to take on the Mariners with the Rockies taking that series two games to one. And one of the greatest rivalries in baseball, Cardinals and Cubs, was postponed due to coronavirus concerns. And I haven't seen any dates on when that one's going to be made up or if it will be made up. And heading to the weekday games and last night's action Monday night. We'll start out in the city of brotherly love with the Braves taking on the Phillies and Really high-scoring game as the Phillies won that one 13-8 over the Braves. Then you had a marathon game, which took forever. You had the Rays taking on the Red Sox up in Fenway, and the Rays pulled that one out 8-7. Let me, let me stop you for just a second there. I, I watched that game, most of it. And after the seventh inning, I went to bed because <laughs> – I did too. It was, it was already three hours into that, you know, into that game. I thought, good Lord, that could be another hour and a half, two hours before it's over with it, if that's the way they're proceeding. But anyway, you're right. I I don't expect these games to be this long. You know, I'm jumping in, but I know like in the NCAA, or should say the uh, NJCAA, the junior colleges, they actually have some rules. Like with you have 20 seconds, you know, basically by either the hitter and or the pitcher has to get rid of that ball. It's like having a, a clock, you know, a shot clock. <laughs> but but on, after games like that, sometimes I think they need to put that back in there. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead and proceed. <laughs> I had to put that one in. Uh, no, that's all right. I, I agree with you there. We had an, an AL Central rivalry, the White Sox heading into Motown to take on the Tigers, first place Tigers, who t- took that one five games to one. And heading up to, back up to the Big Apple, you had the Nationals whooping on the Mets 16-4. to four. Twins heading up to Milwaukee to take on the Brewers. They won that one four to two. The Cardinals had, or not the Cardinals, you had the Diamondbacks heading into the Rocky Mountains to take on the Rockies as they won that one 12 to 8. The Giants head to Texas to take on the Astros, but they dropped that one 6 to 4 in Houston. Then another AL West rivalry with the Mariners and Rangers down in Arlington with the Mariners taking that one 10 to 2. 
a California rivalry with the A's and Angels taking on each other down in Anaheim with the Angels taking that one 10 to 9. And then the third California rivalry going on, you have the Padres and Dodgers taking on each other in the City of Angels with the Padres taking game one 2 to 1 and another postponed game, which was the Pirates and Cardinals. And now looking at the standings, we're going to start in the American League. We'll start in the AL East. The Yankees lead that one with a 10-6 and record, a game and a half over the Rays, who are 9-8. and In the AL Central, you have the Twins, who are leading that one, 11-6, and half game over the Tigers. I know I said they're in first place earlier, but they're only a half game back, which is surprising in itself. Then in the West, you have the A's leading that division, 12-5, and five, four and a half games ahead of the Astros, who are 7-9. Heading back east into the National League, you have the Marlins first place in the NL East with a 7-3 and record, but they are tied with the Braves, who are 11-7, and and both are two and a half games ahead of the Phillies. Go Don Mattingly. Yeah, he's working his magic. Down out in the NL Central, you have the Cubs leading that division 10-3, and four games ahead of the, the Cardinals, who have only played five games. And finishing out in the NL West, you have the Rockies leading that one at 11-5, and five, a half game ahead of the Dodgers. I'm sorry. I had to challenge rankings. <laughs> when you're talk- <laughs> one, one, let's see. You got Marlins number one, but that, that's okay. Get, Manningly's got his boys doing some things. But when you have the Cardinals, what was that again? Are they ranked number two? Yeah, the Cardinals are second in the division at two and three. <laughs> And, and the team above them is the Cubs, who are ten and three. There you go. <laughs> it's a matter of percentages, folks. So I don't know. We, like I said, we're supposed to have sixteen teams in the playoff, and who who knows what this is going to look like in the end? But it's it's curious on a good day, and it's it's a lot of strange things happening with baseball this year. But the main thing we want to talk about is is everybody staying safe out there. So I think that. MLB is taking as much measures as they can, trying to put a season together. I think most teams are, are being smart about this. I think there's a few people out there who are a little selfish, you know, and I'm sorry, you know, talk about Zach Playsack and Mike Clevenger, and they, they should have done better. There's probably elements out there as well, but guess what, guys? You're the ones you get tagged today because you're in the news. And I wish everybody will take care of themselves and have a great, healthy time. I want well, to thank Brandon Noe again for sharing everything with us from the rankings and the games and participating here today. Brandon's also with at the sports blitz one on Twitter. You can find us at the baseball biz and that is on Twitter as well. So anyway, I want to thank uh, first, thank you, Brandon for participating yet once again. Well, thank you for bringing me back on and not kicking me out. <laughs> hey, and getting the recording right the first time. Oh Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I want to thank Brandon and thank all of you in our audience again for being here with us on Baseball Biz and hope to be speaking with you again real soon. Thanks, everybody. 